I'm back at the same spot where I was creating that poor man's plot last week. You should always do a soil test. Understanding the fertilizer is a lot more complicated. That's 12, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> We've already had an ongoing debate here. All right, I'm gonna try one more time to get this straight. Today on Midwest Whitetail, I'm back at the same spot where I was uh, creating that poor man's plot last week. First, I want to look at this and see how the herbicide killed and see if the clover is starting to pop, and then I'm going to do some more maintenance back here. You know, I talked uh, last week about the fact that I need to fertilize and put down some lime, so I'm going to do that today. But let's take a look first and uh, see how things are, are coming along after last week's spray. So here's a spot if you look at it where I would say that this grass is not going to die. It's in too good a shape, but right next to it, you can see some that's turning yellow and starting to look real dry. And that's part of the problem when you're doing these poor man plots is you're using hand equipment and it's kind of an inexact science of applying the herbicide. So there's going to be a few patches like this in the plot. Uh, I'm not going to spray this again with uh, glyphosate because I'm sure there is some clover starting to come up. In fact, we'll look around. Oh, I can see some already popping up in these spots where there's bare ground. And I'll kill that clover if I spray this again. But I can spray these spots with a herbicide called clethodim. That's the active ingredient. There's a lot of different brands that use that. That will kill just the grass uh, out, of, out of a broadleaf seeding. So, I mean, you could use it in beans or you could use it in, even in uh, Big and Beastie. It'll kill the grass, but not the broadleaves. So come back here in a few weeks and maybe hit, just spot hit a few of these places where the grass is still hanging in there. But that's good. I mean, overall, I'd say 95 plus percent of this plot is dying. Uh, so I'd say overall a very, you know, a, a very successful result from the herbicide. Now let's take a look. I'm gonna start walking around here and looking at any open spots and see how much of this clover is starting to germinate. Yeah, you can see a bunch of clover here in this open spot. Yeah, it's real thick. I'm assuming that it's gonna be the same in all the other areas that aren't quite as open. It's just easier to see here. But I'm assuming that down underneath, yeah, I can see some right there. But down underneath this grass, any place the clover was able to make its way down to the dirt, we're gonna see the exact same thing. Lots of little tiny clover plants starting to come up. So again, surprisingly, uh, I shouldn't say that I suppose, but surprisingly good results. I didn't know what to expect of just spreading clover into dying grass, but we had a good hard rain. We had about an inch of rain a few days ago, and I think that just pounded it down in there. I mean, I can see a bunch of it right there, right down through that grass. Um, so this is gonna be a good plot. I'm excited about it now. Uh, a little nervous at first, so it makes sense to put some more money into this. I know I'm gonna have clover here, so it's time to fertilize it, you know, get the pH right. And I've got that on the four-wheeler, so let's go take a look at what I brought with and talk about uh, getting the pH and the fertility correct in this little plot. You should always do a soil test uh, just to find out for sure where your fertility and pH is on any food plot. And you can go to the Frigid Forge website and uh, John has a soil test kit in there that you can purchase. I did not soil test this plot. I've done enough of them over the years on this farm that I know pretty much what I'm dealing with on all of these little ridges. And it's uh, very common to what you're gonna see through much of the Midwest. That is, the, the fertility is gonna be decent, but the pH is gonna be low. Main reason is the leaves from these trees end up blowing into these little plots, and when they rot, uh, that creates a more of an acidic layer. The first couple of inches of topsoil are, are acidic because of the leaves that are decaying on top of the ground. So 
just as a general rule of thumb, I'm always thinking that I have to do some liming and a little bit of fertilizing, you know, and, and I know about what that rate is for this farm. So anyway, let's get into it. This is pellet lime. And it's a lot more practical than using the, the ground limestone, the ag lime, because you can buy this stuff like you see here in 50 pound bags at most co-ops, even some uh, you know, farm supply, you know, lawn and garden stores, you'll find this product available. It's 200 pounds of pelleted lime is equal to about a ton, 2,000 pounds of the ground limestone. So general rate, uh, if you've got about a, a 6.0, well, your, your soil test will tell you what to put on. I'm gonna put on a little over the equivalent of a ton per acre. I'm gonna put on about 3,000 pounds per acre equivalent for this little spot. So I'm putting 150 pounds of pelleted lime on a half acre food plot, which has the about the equivalent effect of putting a ton and a half of ag lime. This will dissolve faster, it'll go to work faster, but it won't last as long. So you're having to do the pelleted lime a lot more often than you would if you're putting a heavy load of ground limestone. Uh, that's the story on the lime. Fertilizer is more complicated to understand than the lime because the numbers, uh, you have to be able to calculate what these numbers mean based on how big of an area you're covering. So this one is labeled 62424. That's NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. Those are the three main nutrients or ingredients that go into fertilizer blends. We're putting it on clover and clover doesn't really need nitrogen. That's why I went with the 62424 blend. So it's low on nitrogen, higher on the P and the K. I'm gonna put on 124848. And, and you'll see what that means once I put these bags out there. But let's just say that the rate that you get calls for some number, you know, whatever that number is, you can concoct it relatively accurately using various combinations of these bag fertilizers. So let's figure out how I'm gonna get 48 on this half acre with these two bags. The number that you're gonna get on the analysis is the rate to apply the fertilizer. So this would be a normal, like if it was an acre, this is how many pounds. Uh, but you're backing this down or increasing it depending upon the area that you're covering to come up with the exact amount of fertilizer. The rate is only gonna tell you how many bags to buy to go into that size of an area. So this is a half an acre area. I want 4848. So I've got 100 pounds, which would be 2424 if it was spread over an acre, but because I'm condensing it down to just a half an acre, I'm getting that 48P and the 48K here. Uh, that's, that's my goal. I can add more to this in the fall. I can come back and hit it again once I see that it's growing and doing well. But it's a poor man's plot, and I'm not gonna start out with dumping a whole bunch of fertilizer in here because this stuff can be a little bit pricey. Uh, this is the most expensive part, the fertilizer and the lime. The seed is a little bit expensive, but I think the fertilizer and the lime is where you're gonna end up spending most of your money. So let's get this down. Uh, again, it's supposed to be a poor man's plot, and you can put this stuff on using the spreader. We've done this before, and I just don't have, um, well, I just don't feel like using the spreader. <laughs> it's a lot more work. I've got a four-wheeler and uh, I'm just going to use that. I mean, but it would work fine using the spreader. It just takes more time and more work. I'm going to start with the fertilizer and then move on to the lawn. This plot should be good to go for a couple of months. I'm gonna come back again and check on it, like I said, and probably have to spray it with a clethodim-based herbicide, which would kill the grasses out. But I think we got a good start. Uh, lots of clover coming up. Now we've got the pH coming back into balance and the fertility bumping up. Should be a really good spot. We just gotta keep the rains coming. In this next segment, I'm gonna run over to uh, the spot that I've called the plow down plot. And if you've been watching Midwest Whitetail for a couple of years, you'll recognize this spot. I killed a buck here uh, the last day of the early part of the bow season during the 2017 season. And uh, it was just getting established that year. 2018, 
uh, would have been a good year for the clover to grow and sort of set its roots and dig in. And we'll see how it looks uh, right now, see how much maintenance it needs, throw a little bit of pH or a little bit of lime and uh, fertilizer on it, and then uh, wrap up the episode after that. This is the plow down plot. And before I go into a timeline of how I established this and got the clover growing in here, we're gonna join Jared for a quick segment. Those that have been around me or have hunted with me know how much I love running trail cameras. I love the whole process of it. Um, not, just, not just really a hunting strategy standpoint. Obviously that's a big part of everyone's strategy these days, but that's not the reason I love it. I just, I love seeing the deer behavior, learning about it. Uh, learning individual buck personalities, seeing how they change from week to week, month to month, even year to year. I love keeping track of pictures over the years. Um, all of it. I love the whole process of it. I'm not afraid to say that uh, I personally look for look more forward to the first card pull of the season than I even do the first hunt. Um, I just can't wait to see what has shown up. So. Uh, this is a time of year where I start to get fired up about putting cameras back out. I usually target that June time frame and before I, I actually do that, I like to spend some time cleaning up last year's trail cam pictures, deleting the doe pictures, um, all the younger bucks, getting rid of or clearing up some space and all that, but also organizing them and categorizing them. So when, when I'm trying to keep track of individual bucks, I, you know, the deer that I have a name for, I actually tag them in my files. That way when I want to learn about a buck or, or analyze patterns or look at pictures, I can just type in that deer's name and boom, all the pictures come up. So that's what I've been spending a little bit of time doing. Um, and today I'm actually going to talk about one buck and specifically and what I've learned from the trail cam pictures and how I can try to apply that this fall. And that's a buck we call Merino. So if I bring up the map here, um, this is going to display all the 2018 camera locations that we got pictures of this buck. And keep in mind, we had the flood, so we didn't get cameras deployed till late October. So I'm taking the late October timeframe uh, all the way up through about mid-December. Um, I'm not counting the late season just because I think that's a different type of hunting. I wanna figure out how I can kill this deer in the early season or during the rut. <clears throat> and as you can see, there's a, there's a kind of a consistent pattern on where we're getting pictures of this buck, um, all kind of in the middle of the farm right here. And before I dive into specific locations, I think you should probably talk a little bit overall strategy. And, you know, people, I hear people talking about hunting, finding buck beds and being able to hunt those. And that's great if you plan on killing that deer out of that bed. If not, you still gotta figure out how he's getting there, uh, you know, how he's either getting into it or out of it. And that kind of brings us back to what I'm doing. Um, I'm trying to find, it's not enough for me to know, here's this deer's 30 acre core area or his 50 acre core here. That's not enough. I want to know those two or three acres that he travels through the most. Where is he killable? Where is he traveling during daylight in a very specific small location that I can target? So that's what I'm doing with this bug. I mentioned he spends a lot of time in the middle of the farm. So if we zoom, if we dive in a little bit deeper right here um, and zoom in on the map, uh, there's one specific little wood lot that's a, it's a really good funnel uh, that I think would kill this deer and my plan is next time I get to the farm is spend a little more time looking for a specific tree. But for now, big picture, looking at the map, I think this spot right here, you know, I'd have to give up a little bit, but with a north or west wind, I think I'd be pretty good in this little spot. And this is where that, that pinch or that funnel bottlenecks the most. And in fact, this is actually right where Mike passed him the second time. So if you remember November 3rd, 2017 is when I passed this deer, our very first hunt on this farm. Uh, fast forward a couple weeks and Mike actually passed his buck um, not too far from there, but right where I'm talking. He came by right at first light, and walked right under, underneath our tree. That was the second or third time we passed that deer. And so information from 2017, including both encounters and trail cam pictures, plus the images I just showed you from 2018, all lend itself to him being killable in this spot. But I'd like to come up with a couple different wind options. So north, northwest, west wind right there, I think I'd be okay. Um, south wind, I think I'd have to move up the slough a little bit. And I, I have hunted this spot before. It's a good spot. It's just not as much of a bottleneck. So you, there's, a, there's still a chance that these deer aren't in bow range if they're coming by here. Now there is a lot of deer that come around the head of the slough right here. 
but they don't have to. They can continue going up this way. So I really like those two stand locations for getting a shot at this buck. Um, you know, that's those are the spots I would like to target. My secondary spots would be on the food sources, and there's three food sources that I think would work for uh, killing merino, um, depending on the different winds. So these are the three main food sources. As long as we get the food to grow this year and don't have water problems, um, keep them fingers crossed for that. But uh, these are the three food sources that I think we could kill merino on, or at least get an encounter with them. So like I said, that's the big picture standpoint. As soon as I get to the farm next time, I'm gonna dive in and try to find those specific trees, maybe even hang those stands and uh, just continue setting the trap for this buck. Uh, again, this is my favorite part of this. I love the whole process. I love the pictures. I love getting to know these deer and how they act differently from other bucks. Um, this is, the, the kill is just a small part of it for me. This is the fun part and I can't wait to start this 2019 process. This started as a poor man plot uh, back in 2015, I think, 2000, I believe it was, and it got to be too overwhelming. It was, there was a number of big trees in here, and once we got everything cut down and tried to drag it off, it was bigger than what we could do with just hand equipment. So I brought a tractor in here. Uh, Chad Lathrop came in here with a, um, a skid steer with a root hoe on it and tore all the roots out, or the stumps out. So it ended up, you know, being a little bit more involved than a typical poor man plot. But this is an awesome little spot down in this valley. It's about an acre in size, completely surrounded by timber. It's the kind of a location that you would expect a buck to move through at any time during the day during the rut. And like I said, I did kill a buck here the 1st of December back in 2017, the last day of the early archery season that year. Uh, so it's, it's got some history, but let's go through the timeline now. I started the first year that we planted or seeded this uh, was frigid forage plowed on clover. We broadcast seeded that in the spring of 2017 and in the, in the summer of 2017, we tilled that in, which is the idea behind plow down clover. It has a lot of nitrogen content and when you incorporate it into the ground, it's really good for feeding the big and beastie. So in the summer of 2017, we tilled down the plow down clover planted it to Big and Beastie, had a really nice full crop of Big and Beastie down in here in 2017. And then rather than tilling it again during the winter, uh, so it had been really early in 2018, say maybe um, February or March of 2018, I came in here and frost seeded the Pier Trophy Clover, which is Bridget Forage's uh, premium clover blend. And that did really well. I mean, last summer was the first establishment year for the clover. And you can see here we are in 2019 and it looks you know, pretty complete. It's still going to fill in a little bit more, but uh, a really cool rotation cycle for a food plot. When this clover starts to play its way out, it'll be another year or two, it'll start getting kind of spotty and, and you know, not as nearly as uh, healthy as what it is now. It'll be time to till it in again and start over with the big and beastie, rotate back into frost eating the clover. So it's just a, a really good cycle for going between uh, big and beastie and clover. So today, uh, I'm just gonna maintain it. It needs to be mowed at some point, not yet. Uh, you can see the clover's doing really well, but there's a lot of sunlight reaching the clover. So I don't need to go in here and clean up the weeds just yet. But I'd say within you know, a few weeks to a month, I'll definitely have to mow this to clean up all the uh, broadleaf weeds that are starting to come in to compete with the clover. So I'm just gonna hit it with the, the maintenance level of lime like we talked about in the last spot, hit it with some fertilizer and then move on. But I thought you'd get a kick out of the plow down plot, a little bit of a history lesson on, on uh, how this plot was created and then the, the rotation cycle of what I planted in here and how that works. Well, that's it for the plow down plot. Uh, we do have big plans for next week already. Uh, we're gonna talk about, I uh, hope I can get Owen involved in this conversation, about whether or not deer have a sixth sense. And it's very debatable. It should be a fun topic to dive into. Well, I appreciate you joining us this week. We'll see you right back here again next week for the next episode of Midwest Whitetail. And remember to always dream big.